Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to talk about that little debate between Thunderfoot and uh, Sargon of Akkad. Did you catch it? I watched most of it. And uh, some of it struck me as a little odd, and I thought I would talk about this strictly from the context of uh, having grown up in America and our history versus uh, European history. And there's one part in the conversation where Thunderfoot is talking about what is Sargon of Akkad's um, objection about that they pay taxes to the EU, but they don't vote on the government of the EU, so essentially it's the taxation without representation uh, kind of argument. And Thunderfoot didn't take this seriously, and I have two minds on that. One, as an American, is to laugh at, at uh, how silly it is not to take people seriously when they're talking about liberty. But then, on the other side of the coin, it's, it's from Europe, and most Europeans don't take the concept of liberty very seriously, so I can kind of see why he would laugh at this. But anyway, I was talking about how minuscule the amount paid to the EU was by uh, residents of the, of the UK, citizens of the UK. And I'm just listening to this thinking, this is completely irrelevant to the argument. The argument is about taxation without representation. Uh, an argument I take very seriously. It was, a, it was a flashpoint here a few years ago. You might remember, you may have heard about it. And in American history, the, the Boston Tea Party, you know, the thing that uh, preceded the so-called intolerable acts, or if you happen to be from the UK, the coercive acts, and that was actually a revenue positive for the average tea buying uh, colonist. The, uh, the 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 uh, the tea act actually reduced the prices of tea sold to Americans. That wasn't the point. The point wasn't that oh this is a great economic issue or oh this is a great pragmatic issue or God we're getting screwed on the market or. It wasn't checking their pocketbook. It was the principle. The, and the fact that we were coming off better at the end of it in terms of our, our uh, pocketbook, you know, the price paid per unit of tea was completely irrelevant. It was the principle that there is a government distant from us over which we exert no control who uh, believes it to be its unreviewable power to decide what taxes we pay. And as I mentioned, we have no say in this. And that was, that was not copacetic here though I realize in much of uh, Europe the attitude is different. So I have two minds on that. One is just the American backdrop, and then the other is uh, more of the Italian, you know, chow kind of attitude. Anyway, so that struck me as a little bit bizarre. It's just not taking the argument seriously, and you don't argue away a principle by pointing out that pragmatically it might not work out great for you in the end. That isn't how you go around judging uh, what is a wise or unwise structure of government, what is or isn't a right that will be protected under the law. I mean, if it is that there are pragmatic considerations where it will be better in your interest to surrender liberty, you can always say that. I mean, it's always possible to surrender a liberty. There's always a trade-off. I mean, you know, this liberty, uh, if we got rid of it, we could be much safer, we could be better off in this way or that way or the other, but th th that's not just, it's just not addressing the argument. So another part of it was uh, talking about, there was an example from Red Dwarf, which I used to watch, I don't, I, they don't make it anymore, but I haven't watched it in years, and one of the characters is repainting a room or something, and he's, I think it was, uh, remember, he was repainting it from um, like flat gray to military gray, or something, one shade of gray to another shade of gray, and Thunderfoot's uh, point about this is, what difference does it matter when what you're doing is taking, you know, from one shade of something and giving a very slightly different shade to something else. It makes all the difference in the world unless you're an anarchist, where uh, whether you're Hitler or the most benevolent government that ever could be conceived, uh, it's all the same. Whether you're gassing, you know, six million Jews, or it's welfare, uh, you know, you're given welfare and rights and freedom and liberty and everybody's protected, there's no crime rate, perfect economy, best health care system. It's all the same. It's all evil. It doesn't matter. There's just no distinction, whatever. So unless you're an anarchist, this argument just simply doesn't run. How you structure a government matters a great deal. And Thunderfoot, and I realize this was on the fly, but he was showing that he doesn't understand different parts of the European Union, which I'll address in a few minutes. So when you go about devising a government, it matters who you put where. And as Thunderfoot correctly points out, uh, not in so many words, but you want to have different factions factions within the government, different, you know, like the tripartite system where they each have some way to interfere with the other to cause a bureaucratic nightmare to slow things down. The underlying idea there being that if the government's not doing anything, then at least you're, you're free to uh, that extent, so go enjoy it. Anyway, whatever. So it slows things down and prevents uh, a, an efficient system from going along, that, that kind of idea, which is true. 
And in any such system, you want to have a backdrop thrown in there somewhere that isn't subject to democratic pressure. But where this backdrop lies is exceedingly important. In the EU, the, the non-democratic part of the EU is the Commission. We'll return to that in a moment. You also want to have a legislature, where the legislature does not have the task of being the enforcer of the law. It is the writer of the law, but not the enforcer of the law. That's the executive. The executive uh, enforces the law, uh, but it doesn't write the law. And whenever you confuse those two roles, you run into problems, some of which you have in Europe at this point in time. And then you want to have a judiciary, the, the, uh, the interpreter, the giver of the law uh, to a certain set of facts that have been uh, contemplated in general principles. You know, fine details here in particular cases, that, that, the common law system essentially. Well, in the United States, we have a non-democratic part to our government. We have, uh, well, in the federal government anyway, and it is the, our Supreme Court. They're not elected, they're appointed. They're appointed by people we elect, but the American electorate has no direct influence on which justices do and don't get on the court. We have uh, no real way to remove them except for impeachment, which is exceptionally difficult to do. It's been tried once and failed. Uh, there have only been a few, a handful of impeachments, and those are for like gross and comp. I mean, like you know, a judge going onto the bench, not just drunk once, but routinely drunk. Those are the kinds of things that get judges removed, engaging in uh, perjury, fraud, uh, being bribed, that kind of stuff. I mean, you really got to go out of your way to get impeached as a judge. Uh, we can't remove them. Their salary can't be diminished. They are they are immunized from the day-to-day -day political concerns, and they should be politically independent. Uh, they generally are, not always, but they generally are. And they're protected from the backlash of the American people, I mean, unless you want to uh, devolve into violence, but putting, a, putting that off to the side. There's nothing you can do to touch them. They're to give their best judgment, their best view of uh, whatever comes before them that's within their sphere of influence. But the trick here is that they're bureaucrats. They, uh, the, judici the judiciary is inherently weak. It has no will, and it, it has no money. It has judgment. It depends on the, the president to enforce the law, to enforce its decrees, and it depends on the Congress to pay for it. It, it can't, uh, it has no input on that at all. They are weak. The commission in the EU is not. Okay, so Thunderfoot was talking about, uh, theoretically, he could get himself as the UK representative to the European Council, and he could propose legislation. No, you actually can't. The EU, um, sorry, the European Council does not propose legislation. It is not a legislative part of the European Union, so you can't do it because it's the wrong body. And second, you can't just go become part of the European Council. Uh, you have to be a head of state, so you'd have to be the Queen or her uh, designee, the Prime Minister. And again, it's not a legislative part of the European Union. You have something else called the, the, uh, the Council of the European Union, which is completely different from the European Council, they obviously want to make uh, recognizing different parts of the EU really easy by giving them very similar names, which isn't democratically elected. Uh, the, the, there are ministers that are democratically elected in their own given country uh, for ministerial roles in that country, but based on their portfol portfolio, they wind up in the Council of the EU, and the composition is not fixed. It might change a little bit here and there. Uh, not based on elections, but based on the subject matter that's being taken up. This is a legislative branch. And then you have one and only one democratically elected legislative branch of the European Union, which is the, uh, well, the European Parliament, uh, the EU Parliament. You have members of the, of the European Parliament. But here's the rub. These are legislatures that have legislators who have no legislative power of any kind. It is not lawful for either branch of the legislature of the EU to propose laws. In the Treaty of Lisbon, I think it was, the, the Parliament was given an absolute right to formally ask the Commission <laughs> to propose a law. Well, I can do that. I mean, shit, I can write a letter as well as the European Parliament can to the, commission, the EU, uh, EU Commission. <laughs> and the EU Commission is just as obligated to pay attention to my letter as it is to pay to this formal request from the Parliament uh, there. In other words, it, it's non-binding. The Commission doesn't have to pay it any attention. They can say, oh, yes, we realize this is oh so important to all your constituents. La, 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 la. We don't care. Go away. So who is 
Who is it that has the legislative initiative in the EU? It's the executive. It is the European Commission. So this would be like uh, looking at the UK system, turning it back to uh, a few hundred years where you had an absolute monarch, an absolute sovereign, who, uh, decreed, who gave the law and was the source of the law and the final judge of the law. That is essentially, uh, well, not the final judge of the law, there is a court for that, but that is the EU Commission's role. It is the executive. It is charged with, with enforcing the law, making sure that the laws that are passed are uh, enforced uh, supposedly fairly. And it is the, the sieve through which all decisions about what laws can be contemplated by the legislature will be contemplated by the legislature. So if the EU Commission doesn't want something uh, to be d debated in the legislature, it has an absolute right to say, Bleh. the European Council gives general guidance. Like, here are, here are our general issues of policy. These are the heads of state and heads of government of the member states. Uh, they're not part of the executive. Uh, they don't have any, any responsibility for enforcing anything. They don't have any responsibility. They can't propose legislation. All they can do is have their little summits where they, uh, they look at big policy goals and they say, all right, EU, here's what we want you to cook up some shit for us and go forth and do that. And then the commission thinks about it and decides and sends it to the, the respective chambers. And uh, so you just can't go do that. So you have an anti-democratic, a non-democratic part uh, in the EU, and it's the head of the EU. It is the executive of the EU, which is also the, the gatekeeper for what laws can be contemplated by the, the uh, weak, useless, effete uh, parts of the EU legislature, which is the whole EU legislature. I anyway, so it matters a great deal when you're, you're varying these shades of, of gray. So here you have, in the United States and in the EU, non-democratic parts. One, the non-democratic part is the head, is strong, is the gatekeeper of what can be validly contemplated in the body, and indeed it's illegal for the legislatures <laughs> to propose laws, which this really knocks any notion of a parliament, to have a parliament that is prohibited by law from proposing laws. I mean, this is Orwell Orwellian, but anyway. So you have that. We have something, we have a non-democratic part here too. They're weak. They're on the far back end. They address issues many years after the laws have been written, the principles have been espoused, and you see how it plays out in society. So this shade of gray between having one non-democratic, well, you have a non-democratic part, we have a non-democratic part, so we're evenly matched. No, you're not, because in the one case, you intentionally make them weak. Um, generally, they, they are only reactive. They have no initiative of their own, uh, but in their sphere of influence, their judgment is final, but even they can't enforce it, whereas in the, the EU model, it's top down on the front end. That's where you want the anti-democracy component right up front in everybody's face. It makes a difference how you paint uh, with this particular brush. Suppose that in the United States we decided to do that. We, well, the president, actually, he should be the one who gets the life appointment. And uh, he should be, as opposed to the legislature, the person who decides what laws can be validly contemplated by the legislature. And then after he's decided it, from input from the Supreme Court, of course, uh, then he tells the legislature, I will permit you, in my sovereign power, my unreviewable divine right of, not a king, I'm a president, important distinction, uh, I will permit you to discuss the following three issues. The first two of which are, how great is it to kiss my ass from dawn till dusk, on your knees and worship me, but I'm not royal, I'm regal not royal. It matters a great deal, so this is just a vacuous question. And then there's just, uh, I, I, don't hold him, I don't hold it too much against him that he doesn't uh, know, or at least when he was talking about that, he didn't seem to know the different parts of the EU. As I mentioned, they do go out of their way to make it not exactly a particularly straightforward organization to understand uh, its different components. I mean, if, if suppose we, we decided to have the Congress of the United States that had Two, uh, it was bicameral, so it had two chambers, one, w one of which was the representatives of the House, and the other was the House of Representatives. That's the European Council and the Council of the European Union. I mean, they sound a lot alike. You just switch, you put in, a, you put in an article, uh, a preposition, reverse positions, and bam, you got that shit. It's, it's, it's uh, well, now that I'm thinking on the Orwell track, there might be some good sense in that. 
it makes it really difficult for you to know uh, who to call up to com whom to call up to complain to. So these are some of some of my thoughts upon listening to um, listening to that and listening to two Europeans talk about liberty and comparing that against like the American model. We're here, even when we make money, we're willing to, to make, uh, wage war against you if you usurp our liberties. We're there. It's, well, it's okay. You don't mind the sovereignty thing as long as it doesn't cost you too much cash, too much dosh. Uh, not to be confused with uh, uh, Daesh. I guess that's what they're going by now. I don't know. The ISIL, ISIS, IS. They have so many different names. A anyway. It matters. Uh, these things do matter, and it is amusing for me as an American to listen to you guys fight about uh, fight about this. And oh, one other point: it was a, he was he asked Sargon of Akkad about how much sovereignty have you lost? Persons don't have sovereignty; states do. So whether or not your nation remains sovereign, that doesn't change whether or not Sargon is sovereign. He is not. He's a citizen of a nation. He is not the nation. He is not invested with uh, all these governmental powers. And unless you're an anarchist, these are distinctions that have a difference. They are worth talking about. If you're an anarchist, this is all mumbo-jumbo. It's all voodoo. Whether you gas the Jews or you save the Jews' lives, it's all the same. Another, speaking a little bit about Orwellian things, the people who, uh, the governments who organized armies to stop the Nazis from killing the Jews are just as evil as the Nazis were for killing the Jews because it's the government. Now, if this has been, been done by a free market, well, then roll, hey, roll up your sleeves, people. Now, now there's some meat on the bones of the skeleton to talk about. That freely raised, free market, voluntary anarchist army, nodding in agreement, good job. You guys are proper and just and doing the Lord's work against the evil statists. So unless you're going to do that, completely back to his point. Otherwise, these shades matter. They matter a great deal because general principles at the level of government apply to millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people's lives potentially, and it is the distinction between equipping yourself to deal with uh, the future in an intelligent way or repeating the problems of the past where you have too much undemocratic power concentrated in an executive who is the gatekeeper that decides what is proper for the underlings to talk about and not. These are not trivial distinctions and you do the argument a disservice by not taking them seriously. Otherwise, uh, I look forward to seeing how it turns out. I certainly hope the UK uh, votes to remain sovereign, votes to leave uh, the EU, but uh, it is your decision ultimately. And uh, oh, as a parting shot here, on CNN today they had an article about what is a Brexit and one of the, the explanatory bullet points we could click on were They'll talk to you. Essentially, they, their readers, uh, their viewers are so stupid. They just knew they had to explain first. What is a United Kingdom? What is an England? <laughs> what is a Great Britain? And uh, they had little pictures and everything. So if you didn't know what the United Kingdom was before, CNN will help you out. And then after you figure out what is a Britain, then you can figure out what is a Britain to exit from the EU. And then they later on conflated NATO and E and the EU. But it's CNN. What do you expect? the most trusted uh, source in name and news. All right, have a great day.